going to be looking today at the theme of laziness. And the title of the message is Sluggard. Who? Me? So let's read Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word this afternoon. We pray that your Holy Spirit will move in our midst. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to each and every heart. This is my prayer and our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. The pastor was going through a sermon series in his church on the seven deadly sins. And um, he met someone from church and he was asked, what sin is he going to be tackling in the coming Sunday? And the, and the pastor said, no, you know, we're, we're looking at the sin of sloth. We're looking at the sin of laziness. And the church member said, well, maybe I'll just sleep in that morning. Now, if you've been doing the wisdom challenge and reading one chapter of Proverbs a day, you probably would have noticed by now that one of the things that's mentioned, often mentioned, is this person called the sluggard. In fact, this word sluggard is repeated 14 times in the book of Proverbs. Now, if you're not familiar with that word, the dictionary simply defines a sluggard as a lazy person. Here's one passage that we just read a while ago, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. It says, How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. That's the description of a sluggard. Of course, when you think about that, this is the guy who wants to sleep all the time. He doesn't like to work. And the opposite of that, of course, is work, right? Proverbs tells us also again and again that if we want to win in life, it requires work. And there are lots of people who don't like work. They don't want to work. They want to win in life, but they don't want to work. And some people say, you know, well, you know, I'd rather wish than work. I'd rather lounge than labor. But if you wish and don't work, and if you lounge and don't labor, you're not going to win. You're not going to win in life. It's funny how some people say this. They say, you know what? Someday, someday, some way, you know, I'm going to get in shape. Some way, someday, my life is going to improve. Some way, someday, I'm going to drift to better circumstances. Some way, someday, I'm, I'm going to get that job of my dreams. Some way, someday, my marriage is going to get better. My family is going to straighten out. Some way, someday, that credit card company is going to lose all my records. No, you wish. Some way, someday, I'm going to become a strong Christian. Now, how exactly does the some way, someday attitude work? It doesn't. Life isn't set up like that. Anything that's worthwhile in this life will require effort. Diva. God set it up that way. If you, have, if you want to get good grades in school as a student, you don't just take your textbook and put it under your pillow in the night, right? And then voila, when you wake up in the morning, you know all the stuff from the book. No, you have to open the book and study it, di ba? You know, when I was a student, one of the mistakes that I, 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 was th I thought was this notion, especially when I look at the very bright students, was this thing that, you know, I see somebody who's very bright and they'll say, you know what? Wala makin ko nag-study gahapon. I didn't study so much, but, and then, then they get good grades, right? And they, they kind of make you or give you this aura, this idea that that's what a bright person is like. And I found out, of course, later that those guys who really topped 
the class, those who went on to get honors, are actually those people who really studied hard at home. But here's what they did. When they go to school, they will pretend. They will pretend that they didn't study. They will just, wow, makunagtoon kayo. And then, dako kayo sa grade. You know? I said, buang ilad-ilad ba nila? How do you get ahead in life? You have to work. You have to work hard. How do you get ahead in your job? You don't give it 50%. You give it 100%. How do you have a good marriage? How do you have a good family? How do you have a good walk with the Lord? It takes work, really. Now, God has a lot to say in His Word about work. And He has much to say about the person who refuses to work. And you've heard the, the phrase couch potato, right? God calls them sluggards. Not a very nice word, actually. You don't want to be called a sluggard. So let's look at what God has to teach us through his admonition in the Proverbs that's directed to the sluggard. Now, at the onset, I want to tell you that it's not necessarily what you think. Okay, what does God want to teach us about the couch potatoes and the sluggard? Now, this afternoon, I want to give you three admonitions from Proverbs and from the rest of Scriptures to see to us, uh, to share to us, uh, what does it mean to be the sluggard and what is God's uh, message for us? What is God teaching us about the sluggard? Okay, so here's admonition number one. Admonition number one is this, beware of becoming a total sluggard. Now, the only place in the Bible that you will find this word sluggard is in the book of Proverbs. Now, the Hebrew word for sluggard is really basically the same word in English, it's the same meaning. It literally means the lazy one. The lazy one. So one of the characteristics of the sluggard is simply lazy. And, and God is telling us that beware. Beware of becoming a total sluggard. In Proverbs chapter 21, verses 25 to 26, it says, The sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more. But the righteous give without sparing. So that's the sluggard. He doesn't want to work. The very first characteristic is that he is lazy. Proverbs 6 to 9, 6 verse 9. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? So the sluggard here is the real couch potato, right? He likes to stay in bed for long periods of time. That's a picture that's given to us. It's lazy. Now, there's an animal in the tropical forest of South America that's called the sloth, or, or uh, the three-toed sloth. And some of you probably saw this in a, in, in a, in, in, in a, in a movie, right? Uh, but you haven't seen one. This is what it looks like. Now, what is it about this animal that gave it the name or that made it deserve the name sloth? Now, let me just read to you a couple of characteristics that I found. They have a quarter as much muscle tissue as other animals of similar weight. They hang upside down from branches without effort. And they usually eat, sleep, and even give birth hanging from branches. Now, they move only when necessarily very slowly. He has a maximum speed of 0.15 miles an hour. Now, you know. Normally, the sloth is green in color, not because his fur is green, but because algae has grown on his body. Mm. So they go to relieve themselves about once a week, but during stormy seasons, when it rains, well, they just do it while they're hanging, figuring, you know, I suppose nobody will know. Ulan ba So, have you seen a sloth? Do you know a person who's a sloth? Some of you might say, you know what? I gave birth to one. Or maybe you got married to one. Huh? So don't point, okay? <laughs> maybe you're pointing at yourself as well. So the sluggard is lazy. Now the sluggard is also irresponsible. Irresponsible. Proverbs 10, 26 says, Lazy people irritate their employers like vinegar to the teeth or smoke in the eyes. You know, if you hire a sluggard, 
you're going to pay for it because he's not going to do a good job at all. They're going to be an irritant to you. And, and the picture is there. they're going to be like smoke in your eyes. You know that song, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes? I, I think it was about somebody who was crying because of maybe heartbreak. But this one, you're crying because you hired a lazy person. So they're going to give you a bad taste in your mouth like bitter vinegar. Smoke gets in your eyes, vinegar in the mouth. Now do you know, and I think you know this, that being irresponsible can, be, can, can become a reputation for a person. Diba? We, we know, kana good siya no, late yun na siya pirmi. Or kana siya siya no, he's, he, he's always, he always promises but he never delivers. And you know, this guy, he, he always just says something but he never does it. You know, we, people say he's so irresponsible. And you know, we, we sometimes have friends or people that we know who have that reputation, right? I'm sure you can think of one. But here's the thing. You don't want to have that kind of a reputation, right? So that's the sloth. He's lazy. He's irresponsible. And third, he procrastinates. He is really good with procrastination. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4. A sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. Now, re remember that Hebrew people were an agricultural society. It means that, you know, there's a planting season, there's a, a harvest season. They follow the season. And the picture that's given to us here of the sluggard is that this is the person who demands his own schedule. It's, season to, it's, it's the plowing season. Na lang. Later na lang. It is the harvest season. Later. I'll do it later. And the funny thing is that this guy looks for something at harvest time when he should know that he, don't, he, doesn't, he cannot expect anything because he never did anything. Right? Doesn't anyone here have, I mean, does everyone, does anyone here, let me ask a question. Does anyone here have a problem with procrastination? Can I see your hand? Okay, some of you raise your hands really slowly, right? You procrastinated. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? I have problems. I have trouble with procrastination as well. I really do. You see, the procrastination, the procrastination, the procrastinator's favorite word is the word tomorrow. And he lives with a motto like, don't do today what you can put off for tomorrow. And so today, let's just lounge. Let's just binge watch on Netflix. Let's just get on a video game and let's play the whole day, get some popcorn out and ice cream. I know I have work to do, but I'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be here. And they procrastinate, procrastinate, and procrastinate. And you know what? The procrastinators have a desire. Verse 25 of Proverbs 21, we read a while ago, the sluggard's craving will be the death of him. So he craves because he refuses to work. And all day long, he craves for more. So the sluggard is not low on desire. There's a lot of desire. But what he'll say is this, I'll do that later. I'll do that tomorrow. How often do we procrastinate? We all can relate, right? So he's lazy, he's irresponsible, he's a procrastinator, and fourthly, he makes a lot of excuses. The, procra the sluggard makes a lot of excuses. And you might want to ask the sluggard, hey, why did you miss work yesterday? What does the sluggard say? Proverbs 22, verse 13, he says, the sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I will be murdered in the street. That's why I didn't come. You know, I heard the news. There's a lion on the loose in the neighborhood. I mean, you know, wisdom must take precedent here. I don't want to get killed. The lion is outside. When you think about it this way, where does the lion live, actually? They live outside, right? Huh? They're always outside because lions live outside. And you could always say that there's a lion outside, that there was going to be difficulties, that there's always going to be challenges in life, there will always be problems to overcome. 
And the sluggard is the one who sees difficulty in every situation. The sluggard also always sees the problem in every opportunity. He's the person who doesn't want to work through those difficulties and those problems and those barriers. And so he just shakes his hands and shakes his head and says, I, I can't do this. There is a lion outside. Let me ask you the question. Do you live in a land of excuses? Do you always make excuses for this, for that, for that? Why didn't you get your work done on time? Oh, the dog ate my homework. How often do we hear that, right? I, I was a teacher in college. I've heard that several times. My dogs ate my homework, sir. <laughs> Amazing, no? Atong dogs, ganahan kid mukha ng homework. Why did you get the report on, done? Well, you know, my computer, you know, had problems. I, you know, did, did you send an email? I mean, I, I don't think I received it. I, oh, I, was that you today? I had a lot of things going on for today. Just a million and one excuses. And you know what? A lot of times, you know, so, the, 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 the truth is there are times, of course, that things do happen, di ba? Maybe the dog really did eat your homework. But most of the time, the reason why we give excuses is because we cannot tell honestly to that person or to others that, you know, I was just lazy. No, You know why I didn't do the homework? I was watching TV or I was playing the games. You know why I wasn't able to make the report? You know, I... You, know, I... you don't want to say that I was just lazy. So you make an excuse, right? Do you make excuses for the fact that you refuse to work? Amen? Do you habitually make excuses for your life? We don't have to. We don't have to live in the land of excuses. We don't always have to justify why we can't get things done. Let's start doing what we can, right? So here are four characteristics of the sluggard. He's lazy. He's irresponsible. He likes to procrastinate. He gives a lot of excuses. And so the Bible tells us, be, be very careful. Beware of becoming a total sluggard. Now you might be thinking, total sluggard, Pastor Nick? You know, you kind of hit that on about the procrastination. And you sometimes, you know, the giving of excuses. I'm like, I, I did that too, but... You know what? There's no way that I'm, I'm a total sluggard. Because, you know, I excel in school. Or I excel at work. Or I'm excelling at some things in the community. I'm not a total sluggard. So here's admonition number two. Beware of becoming a selective sluggard. What's a selective sluggard? What is that? That's the person who does so well in certain areas of life and then throws in the towel in this area or in another area. It's like the person who, who gets A in science and in history, but gets an F in English. Of course, you know that if you want to graduate, you have to pass all the subjects, right? You cannot get an A in all of the subjects and then, you know, fail in English and expect to move on. And some of us wouldn't say that we're total sluggards. But you know what? Most of us are selective sluggards, right? There's areas that we are selective. There's areas that we, are, we, we, we do things that we don't want to, that we are lazy in. Now, I can think of a few. There are certain areas that we tend to be selective, and one area is the area of our responsibilities. We are selective sluggards on our jobs, whatever that job might be. If you're a student, your job is to be a student in school. But you might be a selective sluggard in school. You might be doing really great with physical education, but you're not doing well in other subjects. You're a selective sluggard. For an adult, you might be doing well with your golf game, but you're not doing well at all in your work. You're giving the least amount of effort at work, and you're just a sluggard. Here's how people say it. You know, Nobody really cares about this. I've been here for so long. They passed me over the promotion for so I'm just giving the bare minimum here. And there is an attitude that is so prevalent that we have developed. And I confess, I myself am guilty of this. 
You know what that attitude is? It's the good enough attitude. Pwede na na. Okay na na. Di ba? You turn in a report, it's got some misspellings or some grammar problems. That's okay. Okay na na. You work on a furniture project and it can barely stand and you say, you know, as long as it's standing, it's fine. And you know where you see that good enough attitude? Most of the time, in church. In church. You see, if you're doing work for the King of Kings, you're, you're serving the Lord of Lords, isn't it that we should be giving our best? And this, it's just good enough attitude. It's not supposed to be the attitude that we should have. Whether it's your job, or school, or work, or church, or even a house chore that God has given us. We must give it our very best, right? Remember Colossians chapter 3, verse 17? Can we read this together? And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through Him. We are serving the King of Kings. We are serving God. And you know, Christians ought to have the reputation of being such hard workers and such dependable people and such trustworthy people, people that you can count on, people who are not lazy. And you know, I, st- I have to, I really wish that I could hear of employers who will call employment agencies and they will say, you know what, hey, I need someone to fill this particular position. Do you have any Christians there? Because, you know, those Christians are the ones we want to be working with. Those are the people who give their 100%. I still have to hear that. That's the testimony that you and I ought to have. But you see, the sluggards are also found in church. Amen? Now, we can be sluggards when it comes to our responsibilities. Now, the second area that we are selective selective as sluggards is in the area of our relationships. This applies to all kinds of relationships, friendships, um, romances, even as our members, uh, family members, even our customers or fellow workers. And managing our relationships is not about control. It's about commitment, diba? We cannot control others. We can only commit to them. And Proverbs chapter 24, verses 30 to 31 gives us a picture. Uh, Let me just read it to you. It says, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. And thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. So when you read that, you see a picture here of neglect. The writer is saying, you know, I went past the vineyard that's owned by this sluggard, and it was a mess. It was terrible. Now, to understand this proverb, this part of this, that proverb, we, we have to understand that in the ancient Middle East, a piece of land that is capable of growing crops was one of the most valuable things that you can have. So the owner of that vineyard was supposed to be very blessed to have the opportunity of a lifetime. But this writer of the Proverbs was had this really, really terrible feeling. And he was saying, you know, I was walking past that vineyard and I thought of what it might have been. Kasayang, it is such a mess. Now, when it comes to a relationship, there's a lot of room to grow. And most of the time, our problem is the problem of neglect. And I admit, I have a lot of room to grow here. And you know, I, I confessed this morning, I, I was, when I was preparing this, I was really telling the Lord, Lord, pwede di lang ni Apilon? Because the truth is this, a lot of us neglect our relationships. Husbands, many of us here are sluggards at home. And I'm not talking about the things that we need to do or the chores that we need to do. But when it comes to our relationships with our spouses and our children and our loved ones, we are sluggards at home. And and the writer of Proverbs gets us to think, you know what, how can my home be better? 
It's like that vineyard that's a mess. Or how about our commitment to the community of believers? The small group leaders are so tired now following up. Who is this? Kanus amang kumopil? Who is this? Brad, what happened to you now? And you know what we do? We ghost them. We, 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 we just, you know, na scene mode lang taon sila. Or what about the ministries or, or, or the work of the church? But here's one thing. How about this area? A lot of us are sluggards with the Lord. This hits many of us, right? Sluggards with God. Now, it's the most important relationship of all. Your relationship with God. And you give it very little time, very little energy, and very little effort. And, and you sometimes wish that you have already memorized a lot of scriptures by now. But how could that happen if you barely opened the Bible? And you sometimes wish that you would have learned a lot from the Word of God, but you barely read the Word of God. And, and so often, what happens is we, we get so busy, we get so distracted, we don't spend time with God anymore. Now, if you were here, Last Thursday, during the prayer and fasting, uh, I shared a message entitled Relationship First. If you missed that, I really want to encourage you to, to watch that. I think it's still on YouTube and on Facebook. Check that out. Last Thursday's session of the prayer and fasting. Now, in that session, I shared one, uh, one quote, and I said this, is that our relationship with God validates everything that we do. So one of the biggest dangers in the ministry and in the Christian life is when we do a lot of things, we are busy with so many things that we don't spend time with God anymore. There's a Christian brother named Brother Yoon, a Chinese Christian, who suffered much for the Lord. He was beaten, he spent much, he was imprisoned in China for, for being a Christian. Now, God did a miracle in his life. He, he miraculously got out. And so he went to the West and he began to speak to different churches and groups. And he said in his book that there was a time that he was speaking three, four times a day. Day after day after day. Just ministering to people. And he said, you know what? In his book, he said, you know, God convicted me. He said, God told me, Yun. You are not spending time with me. You're going around telling everybody about me, but you have not spent time with me. And Yun said, the Lord just convicted him of that. And the truth of the matter is, you and I can do that as well. We can get to where we are ministering so much to others, but we're not really spending time with the Lord. Amen? Whether you're a pastor a missionary, a businessman, a student, a housewife. We can all be sluggards in our relationships, especially in our relationship with God. Amen? Some people are total sluggards. And God says in His Word, beware of becoming a total sluggard. And some people, a lot of us, are selective sluggards. Sluggards in our responsibilities and sluggards in our relationships. So here's the third admonition. The third admonition is this. Be aware of the antidote for sluggards. Be aware. You know, we don't like to think of ourselves as sluggards, right? Now, I don't want to call myself a sluggard studied this, as I prepared for this message, and as I've spent time in the Word of God, you know, I was just really convicted because there's so much of a sluggard in me. There's so much tendency for me to procrastinate, so much tendency for me to cut corners. There, there's so much tendency to spend time in other pursuits and not enough time with my relationships, especially my relationship with God. And so what do we do? What is the cure for the sluggard? Now, here's the thing. If you think the real reason 
that the sluggard has a problem is because he's lazy and he's idle, and that's the core of it, I think you're mistaken. They're just symptoms. Because if they're the core, then we would simply just encourage everybody to be industrious, to work hard. You know, not just sit there, but do something, right? And just grit your teeth and and just do it. But at its core, the problem of the sluggard is not physical inactivity, but a spiritual indifference, spiritual apathy. At the core of the sloth is this. The sloth does not care for great things. It has no desire for the kingdom of God. It does not yearn to become or to reach the status that God has intended for his children. Did you know that there's another word that you will find if you study about sluggards, if you study about sloth in the Bible, if you read articles and and blogs about this, there's one word that will come up. And you know what that word is? It's the word asidia. It's an ancient word from the Latin, which basically means a lack of care. Asidia says, I couldn't care less. And when you read about the sluggard, when you read about sloth, they will tell you that this same word is a word that's used for sloth. Caring is not a passive virtue. Caring recognizes that there's a mess, that life can be messy, that that our relationships can be messy. But caring, it goes far beyond just understanding that. It, It enters the mess in order to seek to do something. And at the end of the day, the sluggard really is the person who doesn't care. We don't care. That's why we don't do it. And I think in our society today, in some ways, fosters this. There's a word that's very common that you hear a lot nowadays. You know what that word is? Whatever. Whatever. I don't care. I don't care. It comes when when you make the settled decision that the journey is really not worth it. There's no glory to life. At the end, there's a wall and not a door. It's a settled conviction that life is flat and small and without God. And the result of that conviction simply expresses itself as sloth. Because we don't care, I won't do it. It doesn't matter anyway. So going back to the question, what do we do? Do we just gird up our loins, grit our teeth, persevere, endure, discipline ourselves, pull ourselves together, and bite the bullet? You know, discipline is a great virtue. It's a biblical virtue, right? Perseverance is a biblical virtue. But I think there's a deeper reason. So I want to suggest to you two things when it comes to the antidote or the cure for the sluggard. One is for a, as a perspective, the other as an action. Here's the first one. As a perspective, we must remember that God cares about what we do, no matter how small. Now, I would suspect that a lot of people in society today feel that they are obscure. The, the kind of feeling that whatever you do doesn't really matter. Nobody notices if you're gone. And it wouldn't make a difference. A lot of times when when we have that feeling and that sense, we begin to think that God really doesn't care much about us either. But let me show you from Psalm 33, verses 13 to 15. Look at what it says. It says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. The Lord looks down and sees. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. The New Living Translation renders verse 15 this way. It says, He made their hearts so he understands everything that they do. And these verses tell us that the Lord understands us and the Lord sees us. He watches us. 
And to be seen by God is to be understood. To be seen by God is to be significant. To be seen by God is to be set free. Because we worship a God who sees us. But here's the thing. We also need to see the God who sees in order for us to be able to stand in awe of Him. What difference does all this make in our lives? Let me just put it again this way. It makes absolutely no difference unless you actually meet the gaze of God in your life. Have you ever gazed into the eyes of Jesus? You know, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you want it or not, Jesus sees you today. And he sees you with loving eyes. Let me give you an example in Luke chapter 22. We know this story from verse 60. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, what do you imagine that look meant for Peter? Did it say, when, when, when Jesus looked at Peter, did it say that, you know what, Peter, I knew you were going to fail me. I knew you were going to let me down. I am done with you, Peter. You are such a disappointment. Do you think that was the kind, the look that Jesus had for Peter? Absolutely not. Let me tell you, I am absolutely sure that's not what Jesus meant. Because you know, after the resurrection, how he lovingly restored Peter, right? But have you ever wondered when you read that account, how do we know that Jesus looked at Peter? Well, it's very simple, actually. Because Peter looked back. That's how we know. If he hadn't looked back, he wouldn't have seen that Jesus was looking at him. When Peter had failed, when he had disappointed himself, when he denied Jesus, when he betrayed Jesus, and momentarily took his eyes off the Lord Jesus, but when he looked, he saw that Jesus had never taken his eyes off him. Your brothers and sisters, Jesus never takes his gaze off us. No one is insignificant as far as our Lord is concerned. No matter what failure you have done, no matter what wrong you did, Jesus still looks at you. And when we know that, we can reclaim the majesty of the ordinary things. Nothing that we do is insignificant because our God looks at us. Our God sees us. Our God understands us. That is an antidote for the sluggard. Now, if we understand that, then we can move to an action. The action is this. The second is this. We need to cultivate as well the habit of attentiveness. By attentiveness, I mean that you and I are making our way through life, through our day, with our eyes and our ears open to God, trying to listen to Him with our hearts and hands ready to respond to whatever He wants us to do. Now, attentiveness is an attitude as well as an action. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 and 13 to 17, here's what Paul said. Paul said, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. That's the call for the sluggard, right? Wake up, man. Open your eyes. Stop sleepwalking through life. You know, Paul was actually probably quoting an ancient hymn here, calling the believers to shake off their attitude of complacency. Paul says, wake up, sleeper. But he doesn't doesn't stop there. Verse 15, he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of 
every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Notice that Paul says, be careful. He doesn't say be careless, right? Be careful, be attentive to the opportunities that come your way. Be attentive to what God is doing in your life. And then seize them. Don't stumble through life like a fool. Is the attentiveness is actually a collection of several habits. It's the habit of, that we do when we spend time with God on a daily basis. When we read His Word, when we pray, and, and when we have our daily devotions. That's when we, we begin to develop an ear for the Lord. When we gain understanding or a, a sense of His directions and His encouragement for us. But attentiveness is also devotion inspired by love, not just duty. And that's the difference. You see, when that alarm clock, you know, rings and goes off in the morning and you're having a hard time getting out of bed, what do you do? You just grit your teeth and try harder or throw away the alarm clock. On the other hand, you can remind yourself that when that alarm clock rings, someone downstairs is waiting for you might want to spend time with you and have coffee with you and, and have a conversation with you. When we see life in terms of our relationship with the Almighty God instead of a duty, it's really not difficult to act and do what He wants us to do. And you know what? That is also an antidote for the sluggard. Nobody wants to be called a sluggard, right? Right? We have failed in a lot of areas. We know that. But our Lord has not stopped looking at us. He hasn't stopped loving us. So let's pay attention. Let's allow our relationship with Him to validate what we do. And you probably noticed that I, I, I never talked about, you know, the, the solution to the sluggard is to, to, to be disciplined and to do hard work and to, to be diligent or to persevere. Because those are good things. But the bottom line is this. Sloth is not really a lack of discipline, but a lack of devotion. It's not really a lack of discipline, but a lack of devotion. Because sometimes we think, you know, the sluggard is the person who, who misses doing the, the, these things. Like, I forgot to, to, to write that thank you note or that phone call that I haven't made or that friend that I still have not invited, that unfinished project or that unfulfilled promise. And we, when you try to diagnose it, it would seem that it's because of a lack of discipline. But what it really boils down is a lack of devotion. Because when you have a devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ, your laziness can move to adoration. Your distraction can move to devotion. And the sluggard becomes more diligent. The reason why a lot of people, a lot of Christians today are sluggards is because they have not taken care of the relationship with God. And they see things happening. It doesn't matter. I don't care. It's not worth it. Why isn't it worth it? Because we haven't been hearing and listening to our Lord. So we need, we need our Father to hold us again and remind us that everything that we do is validated from our relationship with Him. So we talked about the total sluggard, right? We say, I'm not a total sluggard. And we talked about the selective sluggard. And we say, yeah, I think I'm one of that. And we talked about the antidote for the sluggard. Now let me end with an illustration. There's a story of a lady who loved flowers. She loved plants. And one time she planted a rare, a very rare vine against a stone wall near her backyard. And she nurtured this, this vine. It grew well. It was vigorous. It was beautiful, but it had no blossoms. And, and she was disappointed. 
And so one day she was looking at the wall, you know, looking at the vine and the beautiful foliage, but there were no blossoms. And she couldn't help but think, you know, what a waste of time. And then her neighbor called her from across the wall and asked her to come over. And the lady went over the other yard of her neighbor. And the neighbor said, you know what? Thank you so much for planting this vine. Look at the beautiful blossoms. You see, the vine had crept through the wall and the blossoms were actually on the other side. But the owner never saw them. And you know what? Life can be like that sometimes. A lot of things that we do not see. And sometimes the effort that we, we do causes us to be disappointed, right? Or, or for us to, be, to give up or to lose heart. And eventually, you and I become sluggards. People without vision. People who don't care. And we ask the question, what difference does it make anyway? Now, if there's anything that I want you to take away from this message is I want you to simply remember this. We have a God who sees us. He made us. He loves us. He cares for us. And He gazes and understands us. And like Peter, He invites us to open our eyes and to look into His loving eyes. Because you know what? He has never taken his gaze out of us. And that's all the difference in the world. Amen.